Welcome to episode 282 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, the Bruins got back on the right track last night with a regulation win over the Vegas Golden Knights, the defending Stanley Cup champions. Scott, I know you still have um, a little bit of ways to go to for the Bruins to get back into your good graces. So let us start off with our opening shifts. But Bridget, please, please lead us off here. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to turn Scott's mic off for the rest of the episode if he wants to be a negative Nancy again. Okay. All right. Um, So I'm going to start out with what was positive from the game, which, by the way, they won in regulation. So uh, for the first time in a long time, um, since that Vancouver shutout all the way back on their, their last homestand to come out of the break, uh, the all-star break, but um, – there are definitely negatives to get into, but one of the things that's been a trend too, not just in this game, uh, is has been the depth scoring. And that had been something that pre-break we were talking about. Okay, well, if your third and your fourth line can't put the puck in for you, then you know how deep are your your playoff hopes? And Boquist has been good. He's scored quite a few times uh, since his call up. Brazo has looked good, but a huge night for Morgan Geeky um getting a hat trick and i think that it part of the catalyst to that was that goal getting called back we talked about like how emotional it was for him to score that goal in seattle against his old team and with we talked about the the girl in the stands that um was a cancer survivor that he helped um try to find a bone marrow donor for and his tie to that and how how i thought that was just like a a great moment that ended up getting ruined with the, the goal called back. And I feel like you could see his emotion continue over into last night's game. And, um, you know, it, maybe it sparked him. Maybe he's, he can go on a run here, but uh, even just talking about this game by itself, really impressive for him to get his first career hat trick. And then the the final goal of the game being not scored by one of your main goal scorers. It's Mason Laura getting his first goal at the garden. Um, so they saved the puck for him. So geeky got to save the puck. Laura got to save the puck. Um, and there were some moments in that game where you could feel the excitement as well as what Scott's about to talk about where there were other moments where you could see the same old thing happening and th the concerning uh, parts of the game that Scott wants to talk about. Yeah, and it, it was funny talking to Geeky after the game. He was asked, you know, if that felt like karma for the goal getting called back. And he said it felt more like karma for getting hit in the face with the puck uh, on Monday in Seattle, which they initially thought was going to be a broken cheekbone. He practiced in a in, in a bubble on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Um, ended up not being broken. He didn't have to wear it for the game. So good stuff there. Uh, yeah, my opening shift is that Listen, the, the Bruins just needed a regulation win any way they could get it. So that's good. They got it. I can't say I feel a whole lot better after this game because there was a lot of the same problems uh, with blowing lead. They're up 3 nothing after the end of the first period. They blow that lead. You end up with a 4-4 tie in the third. Uh, just same game management issues, mistakes, Poor net front coverage on a couple of those goals. Um, didn't like the play by Pasternak on the tying goal, the Chandler Stevenson shorthanded breakaway where he shoots into a body and then just kind of stands off to the side and waves at the puck with his stick, like trying to just knock it down with hand-eye coordination instead of getting his whole body in front of it. And it's like, those are just... They're just the sort of mistakes that you can't make when you're trying to close out a game. You gotta, like, you gotta treat that puck like it's the most valuable thing in the world. And too often, the Bruins aren't. They just keep making some of these mistakes. They they gave up a, right after Vegas cut it to four three. They gave up a, a three on one, almost a four on one. Could have easily have tied the game there. And then even after Lorai's goal, the way they closed it out. Matt Grizzlick takes an unnecessary hold in the stick penalty, puts them on the penalty kill. They get that kill. And then you have a situation where Pasnak has the puck on a stick, can't clear the zone. Marshan, puck on a stick, can't clear the zone. And it's just, they end up getting the win, but Vegas had the chances there to make, make them pay again. And really it just felt like a, like a matter of survival and not the most confident closeout. Mm. 
So I want to take a a step back to yesteryear, if you guys don't mind, to episode 281. Unfortunately, I couldn't be on it, but there was a lot of interesting chatter between the two of you, and and I want to I want to I want to go back to a little bit. Something about a pretzel. Something about a pretzel. <laughs> it's a bit of an inside reference to the listeners right now, but um, Scott, I, I I think I think you may have gained an appreciation. For, for the role I have to play on this podcast at times because it can't be three individuals, sunshine and rainbows and daisies. Somebody has to kind of bring it back down to earth. And I know Bridget said that I'm typically the more negative one, but I don't see myself as being negative. I just, I kind of just like to maybe call out what I don't like, maybe a little bit more frequently than, than you guys. But Scott, last episode, oh boy, my goodness. I mean, he was dancing on their graves already. First place team, Bridget. He was trying to, he was trying to, I think he was trying to, when you weren't here, take over your space and just kind of like box you out and then take over the role. <laughs> like he was seizing power or something when you weren't here. You know what? I, I can do this. The, the, here's the thing. They've done an awful lot of winning the last two years. It's, it's been hard to find negatives at times. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do that. I mean, listen. I grew up a Boston sports fan. I know what negativity is. Like, you know. Yeah. I think, I think my here, I'll be honest. Sometimes I probably have misdirected rhetoric towards the actual team. I think sometimes I I I get annoyed by like some of the 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 people covering the team and the fans alike when they they just look at like the the basics, which is like where they are in the standings and and they don't criticize them. They don't, they don't see the forest or the trees all the time. And sometimes that annoys me because I try to, I just try to be like the voice of reason at times where it's like, yeah, this team is not as good as everybody thinks they are despite being first place. But for that reason, I'm actually, Scott, take, take my, take my old stance because I'm going to slide right up next to Bridget here. Yes! And, and I'm going to be, <laughs> cause here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Welcome to the club. I've been <laughs> Scott, I've been feeling this way about them for a long time. But the thing is, I've known what this Bruins team has been all year. They're they're a team that has a good core, but they've played money ball in the offseason. And credit to Don Sweeney. He's he 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 hit on Morgan Geeky's latest example with his hat trick against the night against Vegas. But Geeky, Van Riemsdyk, Heinen, all great value adds. Watherspoon has been a uh, has been impactful. Laura has been impactful. Um, Justin Brazo is a new guy. Boquist has been impactful. And for me, it's like I've all I've never looked at them this year, despite their standings, uh, their, their place in the standings, and thought to myself, oh yeah, they're a cup favorite because they're ha they they have been covered up by great goaltending at times, and, and you've seen that kind of diminish lately. But that said, I still feel like just, you know, go to the playoffs. And we saw last year, like they had all the analytics in the world and the eye tests in their favor and they lost in the first round. So like, I, I think this team is very flawed at times, but, I, but I, they're not anything I didn't think they already were. So let's just get, to, let's just get to, to, to April and let's just have some fun and see if they can surprise some people. You know, I'm, 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 I'm all optimistic now. I, I will note on, um... You know, I think we kind of glossed Don't over Don't you bully Yui right now, Scott. Don't you... No, no, no. I was going to talk about something from last year. The, the analytics did actually say that like, the Bruins were vastly overperforming. And I, I specifically remember um, Dom from The Athletic, who's like, you know, the analytics wizard. Uh, when they did their playoff preview last year, they gave the Bruins a 60% chance of beating the Panthers. And I remember... And it was because the analytics suggested that those two teams were much closer than the standings. And I remember like Bruins fans flipping on there. Like, How can the Bruins only be 60% favorites? And it's like, oh, at the end of that series, you know, looked pretty close. And I admit I was on the, even me looking at analytics, like I was on the wrong side of that. You guys know, I picked them in a sweep, but that was kind of, you know, I sort of had to like ignore some of the analytics to, to do that. Well, Anyways, and, here, that's, and here's the thing, here's the thing, Scott. You now you now you went so far the other way that you just don't want to get hurt again. Yeah, I'm I'm right now. I'm gonna call it Bruins getting swept in the first round. <laughs> oh my god. Um, but okay, no, 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 no. Razor not not, not doing that yet. But but I I will I will say though. Um, I, I am definitely more in Bridget's camp where it's like, look, like they're still compared to the rest of the league, like 
they're, 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 yes, the Bruins are flawed. Other teams are flawed too. But what I will say, Bridget, to kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to be the mediator here to kind of scoot a little bit back towards Scott. Um, like I did, uh, I did agree with everything Scott was mentioning about how the Bruins defensively give up way too many uh, high danger chances uh, compared to the rest of the playoff um, uh, landscape. And I guess that's just a way. Be, and, you know, is that fixable, right? Bridget, you think it could be. Scott yes. doesn't think it's fixable. The crux of the question that he asked was, is it fixable? And right. is the team worth investing in? Because his original point was they he's fine if they stay pat at the trade deadline and don't waste their assets this year and like call the like chalk this year up to you are what you are and see how far it goes and not really invest and not try to make that big move. So that's why I said I'm not there yet. And Brian, we want to hear your opinion. We already heard your Scott. Let's hear Brian's. No, but you're kind of misrepresenting <laughs> mine. I'm, I'm no, saying. I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm saying it's not. I'm Jerry, not giving up. Jerry, Jerry. I'm not giving up assets to tinker around the edges. I'm not making the trade that Toronto just made, giving up a third round pick for Ilya Labushkin, who, in my opinion, I'm not sure is even better than Derek Forbert. Like, I'm not doing that. I think as we've seen recently, like the Bruins depth, not, not the issue right now, like their fourth line, yep. third pairing, like that, that I'm fine with those guys. If you want to shake things up and add like a, an impact top six score or top four defenseman, I'm fine spending assets on that, but it's going to be significant. That that's my that's main it. take. Like if you're not, if, if that big move isn't there, then I'd rather just ride it out. than you know, give away a third round pick just for the sake of adding a seventh defenseman. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't think the Bruins, they don't have, they don't have the collateral. They don't have, they don't have the, um, uh, the assets that, that other teams want that other teams aren't willing to give somebody for that player. Like the Bruins don't have draft picks. They don't have any amazing prospects. Like, Fabian Lancel could have some value, but nobody's seen him in an NHL game. And if you look at the you know prospect reports, he's like 50th or something like that. And like, um, like which which is a valuable prospect. Like no, no, I know, I know. You know it's it's I, yeah. not like true, true blue chipper, but but he could be, but he could have more value if other teams if he played if he had a couple of NHL games to his name and teams could see and he p- performed well, he could have more value. It, p- teams only the, the the jury is out on him. They don't or the verdict is. What am I trying to say? They don't, people don't know what they have in him is, what, is my point. Um, so it's like, but anyway, um, I don't, I don't want the Bruins trading away high draft picks for this team. I am, I, and they don't, I am very comfortable with them just running with this team that they have, giving it a run. The, I'm okay. If they want to trade, a, if they want to make a, a strong hockey deal, like Scott's mentioned in the past and, and maybe even a polarizing one, like Elliot Friedman had a report that the Bruins would be or, or, or like open or willing to potentially trade Linus Allmark. I, I don't like have I did I saw something like that. Like if the Bruins want to trade Allmark and bring in like a like like a bring in like a a, a true game breaker on defense or offense, like you have you have Jeremy Swayman. Like we've had this discussion a million and fifty times. I'm cool with that. If you want to trade another roster player in, in a hockey trade that you just think is a gamble, but sometimes you have to give to get, I'm I'm okay with that too. But I am not I'm not wasting any more high end draft picks. Like we've seen in the NHL playoffs, crazy like a team could just get hot. What this Bruins team needs to improve on, in my opinion, the most, they need to they need to start locking it down defensively. They are not going to go anywhere with any roster if they aren't if they don't start locking it down and uh, we can talk more about that but that's how i feel I- i'm okay if they want to improve the team but i'm not willing to give away their 2025 first round pick i'm done giving away first round draft picks i know razor says they're a dime a dozen well guess what you need one eventually again and yeah so that's where i land on it let me let me pose this question that also came up do you think based on don sweeney's history at the trade deadline he's more likely to not do anything or to pull off something big uh, he's <sighs> Well, I don't know about something big because I don't know if they can. Well, no, that's <laughs> like, no, but, but that's my point is that the, if the like, if he's really willing to to shake it up, 
which he mm. has been in the past at the trade deadline. Like, do we actually see him saying, we don't have any other option this year. If I want to make this a, a cup contender, I'm going to do this like trade. I'm going to trade Debrusque or trade Allmark or, or make a, a larger move. I, I see it, it's more likely in my mind for him to make a bigger move rather than no move at all. If he can, I think he would. If he can. I mean, like back in 2021, Taylor Hall fell into their lap with Anders Bjork and a second round pick, I believe it was, right? And it's because, yeah. you know, the player had control of where he wanted to go. Um, if, if Don Sweeney can make a big move, I think he would prefer to do it as opposed to standing completely pat. But I don't know if he has, but it takes two to tango. I don't know if other, he's going to find a, a trade partner necessarily with what the Bruins have to offer. Um, so he might want to make a big move, but I, I don't know if he can. Yeah, I, I still, I definitely lean towards they're going to do something. And I guess if just sticking to those extremes of stamp pad versus something big, I, I actually kind of feel like I would lean towards something big towards a shakeup. Um, and I guess, you know, that could depend on what qualifies as big, but I feel like if it's DeBrusque out and another forward in, that's pretty big to me. Like, I, yeah. I think that would qualify. If yeah. Maybe one of Grizzly or Forbert out, it doesn't qualify as big, but if they both go out and you're bringing in, you know, a top four defenseman, I'd say that qualifies. So in, in both of those scenarios, you're probably still giving, you're giving up an additional asset somewhere else. Like it's not, it's not going to be one for one. Um, but I, I can see something like that where, there's guys off the active roster without it being Lena Selmark, although I still don't rule that out either. And I think it's worth noting here that, you know, it does, a, any team that might be desperate for a goalie doesn't look like there's going to be a whole lot of options. Uh, reports this week are that Calgary is going to hang on to Jacob Markstrom. That's one name that had been out there. Nashville is going to hang on to UC Saros. That was another name that had popped up. So, you know, after that, it, it's not like there's really any high-end goalies on the market. So if if someone got crazy and came to you with an offer for Allmark of, you know, a first-round pick and a prospect or a roster player or something, like, I, I think you'd have to listen to that. And I just want to clarify because I feel like sometimes I, I talk and I just ramble and I don't know if I specified what I meant. Um, I'm for the Bruins making a big splash or making a big – shake up as you say scott but it has to be to your point it has to be from i think you know in the nhl roster and i, I just i don't want that big splash to be for, because they gave up you know future uh first round picks which at this point would have to be two or three years from now i, I want to so, i want to get a vibe check on how you think people would react to them trading matt patra who like we haven't talked about in a while but is one of their prospects that has like he's shown that he's he's closer than than Lysel to being NHL ready, and he's he's someone that maybe is below the radar. Though we did hear he's back to working out. He has he's out of his sling, so um after his shoulder surgery. So um anyway, just an update on him quick. But vibe check yeah. on how you think the fan base would react, or and how much you think it's a good or a bad idea if a deal involved him. Yeah, by the Patro was uh, back at Warrior this week. He met with media, um, you know, said things things are going well. He also revealed that this was a shoulder thing that actually kind of went all the way back to last season in juniors that he he thought had settled down and over the summer and was fine, uh, wasn't an issue early in the season, and then it just kind of kept getting worse and worse with sort of each hit, and uh, you know, eventually got to a point where they just had to do the surgery. Um, Anyways, though, to answer your question, I feel like people w certainly wouldn't like it, but the sell there would be, you know, are you getting a center back? And I don't know who that is. Like, if you look at names that pop up on the center market right now, none of them are really, like, younger centers with term. They're all kind of rentals or maybe one year. They're veterans. They're in their 30s, you know. Guys like Adam Enrique and Nick Dowd. So I, 
I would not trade Potra for someone like that, but if there's if it helps you get, you know, a true top two center that you can control for some time, I would be okay with it. But I just don't know who that like I don't have that name right now because I don't know yeah. if that player's out there. And, and the reason I bring it up is because we're talking about like trading players off the active roster. And he's like in this weird in between, like he can't help you on this playoff run. Right. So you're not yeah. like, not like, I mean, a, he also doesn't help you cap wise at all. Cause he's on. No, it doesn't help. Term IR, so. No, but if I, I more, am, I'm talking about like, if this was in like a, this would be part of a bigger trade. This would not just be like a Patra for X play. Like this would be probably one of these multi, um, multi people asset trades. Um, cause, cause if you think about it, it's like, okay, well they might need Jake DeBrusque for this run, but obviously, um, Matt Potter is going to be a big part of their future if they decide to keep him and, and, and build him into potentially a top six center. We think he has that upside. So, um, I still think he's probably valued too high to trade is, is my point that I was getting at, but it's just an interesting situation with him with the injury and not having played, but still teams probably finding him valuable um, and looking for young centers themselves. So, well, if, you know, if, if I'm, if, if I'm personally reluctant to trade away, you know, uh, a first round draft pick for this at this trade deadline, then to be consistent with that, I also don't want to trade away Matt Potra. Cause like you're looking to find in a, in a draft, what you have in Matt Potra and he's 19 years old. So, you know, unless your name is, you know, Connor McDavid or, you know, Connor Bedard or something like, like you, it's tough to call anybody untouchable. Um, but you know, as, as it pertains to the Bruins organization and their personnel, their player personnel, I would say Matt Patra, um, outside of David Pashnak and, and Charlie McAvoy, he he's, he's, he's untouchable. I think at this stage, because you just don't, he, the, the future is so bright for him. Um, and, 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 you know, there's not much of a difference between him, between him and a first round draft pick, uh, next year, or the year after. So I, I want to protect him for mm-hmm. sure. Personally, I, I would not like to see him go. I think he's a good fit culture wise too. his personality yeah. just works well with the Bruins. And um, I, there's just so many things that I think make him work, work for the Bruins organization the way that we, because the thing about the, the beginning of the season, we're like, okay, this guy just like kind of almost fell into their lap that he was ready at the right time when Bergeron and Krejci left. And it was like, you saw this like ray of, of hope, um, and then unfortunately the season ending injury comes, but I, I, I think he's, he's un, untouchable in a way, Brian, like you said, I still think Mason Laura is untouchable. It's another prospect turned pro recently this season uh, who has been playing better and better. Um, and so like those two guys, I would say don't even like, don't even take calls on those guys, but I mean, obviously yeah. they're going to listen, but um I yeah, I was going to say, like, no no one's really untouchable for me, and, and those two aren't either, but it, it has to make a lot of sense. It has to be for clear, impact, top-of-the-lineup player, under team control, not a rental. Um, and, you know, to me, both of those guys, I would say, are more valuable than, than a first-round pick that's in the 20s. Yeah. If, if you look at history of first round picks in the twenties, more of those missed than it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Potter and Laura have played NHL games and had success and showing like, there's a really good chance. They're going to stick at this level and be good players. Um, You, you would just be hoping for that in the twenties. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why I got with this, with this Bruins team. That's why I'm not, I don't want to move any, you know, draft picks or pro- high-end prospects. Like, if you want to take a roster, I know Potch is kind of a tweener and, and Laura, but I don't, I mean, like, roster players, you've had years of sample size on here. Like, I, I don't want to part with pros- with th- th- these high-end prospects and and, uh, and, their, and their draft picks in the future years. Like, I stick, if you want to shake things up, shake it up on the roster um, with guys you've seen and with guys with expiring contracts. And, and look, Jake DeBrusque is such a, He's such an interesting discussion because Bridget, you've talked about in the past, like, and Scott, you as well. Like, you get rid of him, like, you're getting rid of a quote unquote top six talent that you have to, you know, replace. And this team isn't 
offense, an offensive juggernaut. And like, you just, you don't want to get rid of some of the goal scoring potential that you have, but there's a difference between um, ceiling and reality. And the reality is I think he's ninth in the Bruins in scoring, which is not good enough for Jake DeBrus, not even close. Like to, um, you know, what is he got 27 points in the year or something like that. It's, we all know he's not, he's underperforming on the, in the scoring department, the, the production department. So yeah, it's like, what do you do if you're the Bruins? Like, do you, do you guys still feel like you use him as a, as a, as a trade deadline ac- acquisition, so to speak. And if he walks, he walks for nothing. Like where, where, where are you guys at with him specifically? I know Scott, Scott, you're open to shaking things up, but do you, do you feel like, have you gone from it's got to be a win to like it still has to be a win, but like I'm kind of maybe hoping for something like that to happen? Uh, you have to get an upgrade. Like I, I can't trade away Jake DeBrusque, and then the only forward I bring in is a third or fourth liner. Like that, that just hurts you offensively too much, even with DeBrusque's maddening inconsistencies. And I think now he's up to what. 13 of the last 14 games but he hasn't had a point. But what does that mean, um, Scott, though? When you when you say it has to be an upgrade, like what exactly do you mean by that? Because what trading partner would want to like lose a trade? Like, you know what I mean? Well, I, I don't think it's gonna it's not gonna be a one for one. Like you, you're okay. not you're not trading to Brussels one for one for a better player, but okay. as part of a package or two separate trades or however it would end up looking, um, you know, like it is worth noting here that it was just there was an 82 game stretch from like late uh 21 22 season through much of last year where debrus was a 40 goal scorer over an 82 game stretch like let let's not as bad as this season has been scoring wise let's not forget that like, that wasn't that long ago so you can't you can't just give him away you can't just say well you just have to trade him because you got to get something before he walks in free agency. Like I, I don't buy that. Um, I have no idea what the market is. I imagine there are teams who would be interested, but you know, what are the, do they see him just as, as a third liner? Do they still believe with a change of scenery or with the right center next to him? He, he, he has a second liner. Like, that I just don't know. Like I just don't have a good feel for how so, other teams are viewing. But la- so last episode, and, and just quickly, Scott, because that, that look, that's a fair point to bring up. Over an 82 game stretch, not too long ago, he was a 40 goal scorer. The problem is that sample size was sandwiched between two really porous, you know, sample sizes of a season. But last episode, Scott, you mentioned to Bridget how you're at the point you you think the Bruins should shake things up. And you mentioned it on Sunday skate as well. So is he the player in your perfect scenario that they would move to upgrade and shake things up? Like what, what would in, in, in Scott McLaughlin, uh, GM land, like what is that? Scott what, McLaughlin. What, what Scott McLaughlin? Thank you. Very, very good. What's that? What's that ideal shakeup? What's who's, who's going out? What's coming in? Like, or have you just have you thought that far into it? Or are you just saying just sh- shake things up? I, I don't know that there's an ideal guy. I guess whichever one gets you best value and whichever one you can easily parlay into an upgrade. So if if DeBrus gets me something, whether it's all in the same deal or two separate deals that allows me to get a more consistent second line scorer, or you know, even a first line, like if we really want to go to the, you know. Bridge and I both mentioned like our dream targets on the last episode of Pavel Buchnevich or Jake Gensel. Pretzel. Like if there's if there's any way of going after those guys, awesome. Sign me up. I don't know if it's going to be that. It might be something a little you know a tier below that. Um, but again, like I'm also I'm still open to trading Linus Elmark. Like I still feel like that's on the table. If someone with other goalies reportedly off the market, not getting moved. If someone wants to get crazy, uh, say the New Jersey Devils or, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe the Colorado Avalanche. Like, I'll, I will absolutely listen to that. What, and here's here's the funny thing that, that when Razor was talking about, it was contradictory to me and I wasn't going to, like, really bring it up because we also didn't have much time left in the show. But, like, if you're if, – if the Bruins really 
are not willing to go to a goalie rotation in the playoffs, then that should make the possibility of trading Allmark, uh, you know, it should be more, they should be considering it more if they're, if they're thinking, okay, we're just going to ride one or the other. Um, and they, they're only, they only are willing to part ways with Allmark. Doesn't that make it like, okay, uh, we're not going to use one of these goalies in the playoffs anyway, which by the way, Scott and I both think, they should rotate and other people do and some people don't but like if inside the Bruins organization the plan is to ride one maybe you make the decision early maybe you have to make the decision right now pick pick the one which would be Swayman because of you know the situation with where he's younger and they want to keep him in the organization for a longer time make the choice now kind of hope for the best health wise and use that as the big shakeup move if that if you are sure that in the playoffs you only want, you do not want to use a goalie rotation. Well, and and it's worth noting that publicly they've said they are willing. Jim Montgomery has said that Don Sweeney said it. Um, Now Montgomery also said last year he'd be open to it, but obviously they didn't do it. So saying you're open to it and then actually doing it are, are two different things. So you're right. Like we don't know their true feelings behind the scenes. Um, but when, when I asked Montgomery directly early this year, do you think you would be more open to using a rotation this year? He straight up said, yes, like with no hesitation. So that's, that's the public answer, but who knows what they're actually saying in private. Right. And that was back when these goalies were, lighting the world on fire outside of last spring. I mean, they both come back down to earth. Like this whole goalie platoon, it's great if you have two of like the best goalies in the league. But I mean, if they're just two guys, I'm not, that's not, that's disrespectful to what they've been, but I'm just saying like, they've both been like pretty pedestrian in the last month of hockey. Like unless I look it, the whole goalie platoon thing, I've been on record saying like, in, I don't, I really don't love it. Like if I, you know, I'm okay with using two goalies in the playoffs. If one goalie is not playing well, but, um, but I, I feel like that argument is completely invalid if they're not two of the best goalies in the league. The, otherwise, it's just like, uh, whatever. It, it doesn't. We need to get into that debate. But I, I just think it's stubborn if the, if if they don't if they're unwilling to move all mark because they want to do this goalie platoon. If he can bring you some shake up, because guess what? Oh, you said they don't have anything to, to offer other teams that other teams don't have to offer. In fact, they have less. So you got to get creative. And if you want to, here here here's also what annoys me about people not being willing to trade on Mark because they don't want to ruin this goalie platoon possibility. The Bruins don't have any high draft picks in the coming years. They have very little to virtually no cap space. Okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, so what do you do? It's like the Bruins, you have to trade from a position of strength, right? And people keep saying, well, no, we don't want to do that. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like, how else are you supposed to upgrade your team if you don't have draft picks, you don't have true high prospects, you don't want to get rid of those, you don't have cap space, but you want to break, you want to, you want Don Sweeney to be a, to be a buyer with what? Okay, where's a position of strength? Goaltending. No, no, that that's what separates us from everybody else. Well, hello, do you want to improve your team elsewhere or not? Like, you can't you can't be that stubborn. It's just that's the way that it is. So if, if Allmark brings you the best return and you want this team to go all in, it is what it is. You and you be believe in to. your other goalie and you believe that your other goalie can handle the yeah. playoffs by himself, um, which which most teams, they don't even – it's not even a thought in their mind because they really only have – they don't have a 1A, 1B. They have a 1 and a 2 if they're lucky. Sometimes you're like, you have a guy at the end of the bench. You're like, I hope we never have to see that guy. Um, so like, this is a conversation that other teams don't even have, can't have right now because, um, but like, it should be pretty obvious that if you don't trust Swayman to handle the playoffs by himself, that then you already have an issue, right? Like that should indicate a larger issue rather than the whole goalie duo uh, decision-making process. It's like, okay, well, if you do trust him enough, then you should trust him enough to do it by himself rather than just in a duo. Yeah. And yeah, if, if you don't trust Swayman, then I don't know, then, then put him on the trade block. Like 
why why would you lock up a goalie long term if you don't trust him? So, you know, it is fascinating because like obviously they haven't given Swayman that opportunity. I know he got he did get the five straight starts at the end of the Carolina series two years ago, but he didn't start that series. You know, um, Omar's the one that they have given the opportunity to run with it in the playoffs, and two years in a row he hasn't held up. He, you know, he lost it after two games in the Carolina series and gets, you know, ends up benched for game seven against Florida. So, um, yeah, whether it's now or the summer, like you, you do have to pick one of them at some point. And, and we all assume it's going to be Swayman because he's, he's younger. He has more potential and, um, it just makes more sense. But yeah, if you, if you're cut, if you're moving on from one of them in the summer anyways, which I think is a strong possibility, like you should at least be open to it now. Not saying you have to, but I mean, you know, my opinion, yeah, my, explore your options. My opinion, guys, and and I, I don't really understand how one can argue this. You might not want to move one of the goalies, but if you want the Bruins to make an to bring in an impact player like a top six, a, a, a bona fide top six forward addition or a bona fide top four defenseman. If you want the Bruins to make that move, Lena Solmark is the only guy that's going to get you that back. And believe me, I know that he has a you know 15 team no trade clause. I get it. And I know what contender is going to want to bring in a goalie because they're a quote unquote goalie away and then give you back an important roster player. I get it. I know. But there could be a team that's on that's not on Allmark's no trade list that might not be a playoff team, but maybe they're a bubble team and maybe they're on the cusp of being a really good playoff team and they're just a goalie away. And the team acquiring him is looking towards next year and beyond. Maybe not this year. I'm just saying if the if Bruins fans are crying to the heavens for 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 the for Don Sweeney to add to this team because this team's in you know a top team in the league and they should be going for it because they're cup contenders. What other what other player or prospect or pick can, can can the Bruins trade away that can bring in that player? It's it's it starts and ends with Linus Allmark. That it's that simple. And if you are that stubborn where you don't want to give up this whole possibility of a goalie platoon, then guess what? You're not getting an impact player that you want at all. Not it's not happening. So Ooh. Bruins fans got to decide. What about the goalie hugs, Brian? Sorry, that <laughs> listen. I thought the goalie hugs was very endearing for quite some time. It's starting to get a little bit. Well, but like Mickey, if you Mickey Mousey for me now. <laughs> if you it inspired and I love, kids all over the world, Brian. And I love Disney. I'm just saying it's it's yes, a little. You, know. it's, you, you, you just you, you know you've you've won one game of regulation in the last three months. It seems like, and here comes the goalie hug. And it's like, uh, guys, come on, we're just on a ten game slide. <laughs> well, and, and to your point about like you know well, who, well, who well, you can well, trade. Well, what? Hmm? I said, welcome back to the next. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's keep it. Let's let's keep it back on track. No picking sides right now, and and talk about what like what the actual trade would look like. Because would like would you be willing to trade them inside the division, like or inside the conference? I should say to New Jersey, and like then what they would have to give you picks that then you turned into that you turned around and sent for a forward, like. Don't be afraid to make your team better. Like if, if you think that you're making your team better and you face Linus Allmark in the first round and he's the goalie for the Devils and he beat you in the first round, you know what? It is what it is. If you're making your team better, that's that's what Don Sweeney's job is to do. His job is to make the Boston Bruins roster this year and beyond as good as possible. You can't you can't sit here and be like, well, we don't want to make New Jersey better too because we can play them in the playoffs. I, I know that's not ideal, but – you have to do what you have to do, or don't move them at all. I'm, just, but you can't uh, be afraid. You can't. Also, be afraid. I, I don't know. Is, is New Jersey willing to include, say, Tyler Toffoli in the trade? Right, because that that interests me. Yeah, twenty five goals, pending free agent. I, I saw a report that the Devils are, I think, starting extension talks, but who knows what happens there? So, um, you know, it, it could. Like there could also be a, a hockey trade there within the conference. So um I 
you know, I, I wouldn't trade him to like a, a playoff team that I might meet in my division. Like I probably wouldn't trade him to Toronto. I no, no. idea if, if they're <laughs> no. still looking for a goalie or what they're doing, but um, I, I guess New Jersey, like I know you, you could end up facing them in the first round. Like I get that that's on the table, but. I think I would take if the offer's right, I would take that chance. Well, that's how that's how this all gets so complicated more than it has to be, right? Because people will sit there and say, trade all mark. Okay. And then a million people will come from behind the, you know, the sheds and be like with the with the, the the pitchforks and torches and be like, nah, he's gonna he can't go to half the league. He has a no trade clause to half the league, and you don't want to bring him in trade him in, in the conference. That takes away another half the league. So you're down to eight teams. Good luck. Do they it's like guys. Like I, if you look at it that way, sure. But you know what? If you look at it through the lens of just using half the league that is not in his no trade clause, and also you could trade him to a team that's on his no trade list, but he'd have to approve it, right? Um, so it people just people narrow the window in the hallway so much on these conversations. It's like it it's the, it doesn't have to be that that like. Oh no, he can't go to half the league because he they're on his list, and you don't want to trade him in the conference. So there goes the other half of his list. It's like, guys, no. If the Bruins can find the trade a trade partner, you can't you can't be afraid to make your team better because he might come back to haunt you later on. That's a bad way to do business. It, it, that's my opinion. Um, and I'm not even saying I'm not even saying that that they have to trade him. I'm just saying if if you're a Bruins fan that wants this team to get an impact player, he's your only avenue to get to getting there this year. So Bruins fans need to choose. Do you want the goalie hugs and the and the playoff platoon, or do you want the high impact player at the deadline? Because he's your way to get that player. And so, you know, that comes down to the fans and what they prefer, but you can't have both. That's what I that's how I feel. Yeah. Agreed. Brian, like, Brian you you're you're too tall today. Your head is blocked by the Brian skate pod logo this entire tall. time. He's trying to like look tall. Yeah, that's what I've been seeing the whole podcast. Is Brian's <laughs> face is just the skate pod logo. <laughs> so maybe maybe uh flip turn your camera up a little bit, Brian, or something. Get that out of your face. Brian Brian's playing goalie. There's there's no room to shoot past Brian today. No. Yeah, you can't get it. <laughs> he, he's blocking them all with his head. <laughs> oh, we should make skate pod pucks. Can we do that? Is there a way to get like custom pucks with just our skate pod logo on them? So I have a wall we of should. pucks back here. We yeah. should. We Bridget could also has get... a new Bridget also has a new Bobby Orr photo in her background today. Yes, I do. With the puck from the old garden. That is what I have. Maybe 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 this is oh by the way, guys, I I I um ever since Twitter turned into X, it's like such a I don't know what's going on in that app, but I, I, I like deleted my app like a while ago because I was like, this is, I don't know what's going on, but this is, you, you see the most ridiculous content. I just got rid of it. And then, um, I don't know, I re downloaded it just for like literally for like the skate pod and stuff and like brewing stuff. And I, I got logged out of the skate pod account. So I don't even have the password anymore. But maybe one of you guys can put up a poll. I'll, um, I'll just, I'll just share it right now. Any yeah, of us want to log um, in. It's password. Yeah, just, <laughs> just fire off whatever it takes you on. It's uh, it's Scott's pops dollar sign. Um, <laughs> but one of you two, maybe you guys can put out like a some sort of question about like based on this conversation, like like would you prefer like you know would you prefer the the goalie platoon or you know the, I don't know how to word it. Scott's the wordsmith, but. Um, I'd be curious to see people's responses to that because I, 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 the more we talk about this, it really is one or the other. It is. Yeah. It's true. If you, if you if you want to go with the goalie platoon and, and and roll with this team into the playoffs and maybe add a depth defenseman or maybe a middle six forward for a mid round pick, and, and yes, you can go that avenue. But if you want that high end player because you want this team to go all in, Lena Solmark is the guy to do it. So I don't know if people are realizing that just yet. Right. Yeah, let's swing this back to the to the present and uh, the the this Vegas game and you know another blown lead. But was it a game last night? That's right. But a regulation win. So I I started with how I feel, which is I don't feel better at all. But how how do you guys feel? Like was was this a step in the right direction? Still big concerns. Just 
takeaways from from that game? Yeah, I mean, it, anytime you get a win when you're sliding, it's it, it makes them feel good. Um, Bridget, to your uh, opening shift, I believe. Yeah, the depth scoring is 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 promising. Um, you know, geeky again, a great value add. Hein and Van Riemsdyk, Brazo and uh, Boquist seem to have some chemistry in the fourth line. Boquist seven points in his last seven games. Brazo is bringing size and um, you know possession and just a, a different look to that line. I like him there. Um, so you know, I'll be honest, guys. I, I'm not. Yes, they could they could use help up front, um, but I'm not too too concerned with them right now up front. Like for me, like I said, you know, maybe a half hour ago, they gotta they need to tighten up defensively. Scott, you mentioned like we're approaching March. We're at, well, we're in March. It's March first, and the deadline's a few weeks away. And mm-hmm. defensively, this one team, week away. Just yeah, it's one days. week. One week away. Defensively, this team is giving up far too many scoring chances and uh, towards the bottom of the of of the pack among playoff teams right now. And they're not going to go anywhere if they don't lock down defensively. And, and I think, you know, part of that's probably personnel. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the goal, I figure who it was, uh, the, the Alex Petrangelo goal last night, it's like he gets three whacks at it and, and McAvoy and Grizzly are just standing right there. It's like, guys, that's just, so that, that yeah, shit has McAvoy to change. McAvoy just like, McAvoy kind of just comes like storming through the slot, like a, runaway train mm. just goes right by <laughs> yeah like he, he he ends up with one whack at it misses and then he takes himself out of the play like that not good and then and then the i think it was the third vegas goal it was so carlo throws it up the wall and into basically a 50 50 battle brazil loses it and then boquist and carlo bump into each other at the front of the net and um amadio just ends up completely all by himself and like, I don't want to be too too harsh on that line in particular being out there for that goal because the fourth line was excellent uh, Thursday night for the most part. Like that was really the only tough shift I think. Um, when when they were on the ice, Lauko, Boquist, Brezzo, the Bruins out attempted Vegas seventeen to two. Like that's that's impressive. And you mentioned Boquist now seven points in seven games. Uh, he has. He's played 26 games now this season. I don't know if you get if you guys saw this, what what I wrote, but um, of course, do you know how many I of those can read everything you, that you write? Do you know how many of those games he's been a minus? Oh, isn't it only like one? One, and it was back in December 15. Mm. Yeah, because I had one. I had gone down my own deep dive into the Boquist stats not that long ago. Um, on a, a different opening shift that was related to what the way that their fourth line was trending in the right direction, um, and with the new personnel. Uh, so my one of my and this isn't even just a thought about the Vegas game, this is a thought about who wasn't in the Vegas game, and that's Derek Forbert. And we talked about it at, during the last podcast. Is was missing that meeting enough to like push him over the edge into the into a place where they're like, okay, maybe this is where we get rid of salary. Maybe this is who we move out um, and how much it was going to affect his playing time. And so he's, he's been out two games in a row, whether that is completely to do with play or, or meeting or what we're not sure they, they are not going to come out and say that, but it it just begged the question, how, how much will it affect his playing time? And as of right now, he hasn't gotten back in a game since then. So. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to, say that like they're willing to trade him because he slept through his alarm. But, you know, obviously he hasn't been playing great and you have to make sure <laughs> that when you're not playing great, you're doing everything. And then some, uh, obviously, so that, that just came at the worst possible timing for him personally, because mistakes happen. Right. But yeah. Um, and he did not give that. Ex- he did ex- explain that at practice yesterday, yeah. um, that it was an alarm issue. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, and and yeah. does doesn't help that Wotherspoon and Shattenkirk have played well these last well, couple games. And that, Shattenkirk two assists Thursday night. Wotherspoon was second among defensemen in minutes. He played over twenty minutes. Um, you know, Lori. I know Lori had a tough game in Seattle, but for the most part, he's been playing well. So yeah, yeah that like, game was the anomaly of the call up. Like he's been good a majority of the time. I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think. 
I think if this blue line is completely healthy right now, I think the the top six defensemen are McAvoy, Lorai, Carlo, Lindholm, Watherspoon, and Shattenkirk. And I don't know if you guys watched the – and yes, so that means that Grizzik and Forbert are out. Um, the latest behind the B, which I think may have dropped, honestly, within the last like hour or two, but I did catch it, and, and, and Watherspoon was mic'd up for the game in Vancouver. I think because he's a, a BC native, but he's mic'd up, and so you know the camera's harping on him the whole game, and you're hearing what he's talking like throughout the game. And he's a gamer. Like he's boxing out uh, JT Miller. Um, you know, he, he's just, he's very engaged. He's, he, in my opinion, has earned a spot in the top six. And I'm not saying that they couldn't use an upgrade on defense just in general. But if you're, if your defense is McAvoy, Lorai, if, if McAvoy, Lorai, and Lindholm are three of your top four defensemen, that should be enough high end talent. Uh, all around the ice, they shouldn't need to bring in another top four guy because Carlos the fourth guy. Um, maybe you can use a bigger body and more toughness over Shattenkirk, but I just think, you know, if Forbert and Grizzik are out, those other six guys I think are your ideal six defensemen. I think yeah. they need a forward, but but Scott, this kind of goes to something you said because Sweeney and Neely both had made comments this week to, to different um outlets about what they're looking for and they brought up toughness again yeah so cam neely talked to fluid oceans out of the athletic on the road trip don sweeney was on the nesson pregame show thursday night and you know both talked a little bit about the trade deadline and what they think the team needs and they both went to, to physicality toughness um specifically on the blue line Neely also mentioned a scorer. So, and they both acknowledge that, you know, it's going to be tough to add given their situation. So it came with all the necessary qualifiers, but it it is clear, like when your GM and president both go to the same thing and mention physicality and toughness, like gives you a really good idea of what they're looking for. Um, and I think it starts on the blue line. Like they both specifically said, you know, another defender like that, a rugged defender. So, uh, you know, personally, I, I don't know. Like I, for a, a long time, I was of the opinion that the left side of the defense was the biggest need. Maybe it's just recency bias because of how many forwards have gone quiet. I do kind of think a score is a bigger need right now. Um, but I also I, I get what they're going for on defense because as we've talked about, they they give up too many scoring chances. They give up too many net front high danger chances. So I yeah, you absolutely could could use an upgrade there. Scott, is there a stat that you can filter for individual players um for how many times there are like net front high danger chances while specific players are on the ice? Like Forbert, yes. like how many how many and, do they give up when he's on versus McAvoy versus you know maybe a guy that they bring in? I I can pull it up now, but as a preview, I'm gonna tell you because this is what got me in trouble when I tweeted positive things about Derek Forbert. <laughs> he he grades out well. Like they, he's the Bruins defender that is on the ice for like the least amount or close to it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Bridget, as it pertains to Sweeney and Neely's comments, this Boston Bruins team, if they want to get to the Stanley Cup Finals, they're going to have to get through, you know, one or not both of Florida and Carolina, in my opinion. Both of those teams, they play the right way. They work hard. They have size. They have physicality. Yes, they have skill, but they have the they have the work ethic and the will that makes you tough to play against in the postseason. And so this Boston Bruins team, in my opinion, you know, they don't have, yes, they have David Pasternak, one of the best offensive players in the world. Beyond him, you know, the Bruins aren't the most gifted offensive team. Okay, they have to work hard for their goals, like Scott has said. So if that's the case, and that's not going to change, like that, that's they are who they are offensively this year. If you're not going to be a highly – offensive juggernaut which even if you are that team you still have to be tough and, and whatnot if you aren't going to be that team then they need to be really tough to play against 
and they have to be stout defensively. And so their four checking game and their cycling and their and, and their low game has to be impeccable. Uh, their transition game has to be really solid, but defensively in their own end, they have to, it has to be their identity. If their identity is not going to be a high scoring, high flying team, like it was frankly, most of last year, if that's not your identity and they don't have the personnel to, for that to be their identity, it has to be defensive and it has to be uh, tough to play against on, on all three, so, uh, all three zones. So getting players that help those areas of their game, I think uh, is is important. So I kind of co-sign with with uh, management here. Just to quickly run through this. So five on five, high danger chances against per 60 minutes, uh, starting from least amount. Derek Forbert, 9.7 per 60 minutes. Kevin Shattenkirk, Hampus Lindholm, Brandon Carlo. A little bit of a – so that's 10.53. A little bit of a jump then to Parker Wotherspoon. 12.4, followed by Ian Mitchell, Mason Lorai, Charlie McAvoy, eighth out of nine, and Matt Grizzlick bringing up the rear at 14.1. So now also worth noting context there of the guys towards the bottom probably getting the tougher matchup. So that's certainly, uh, especially in the case of McAvoy and Grizzlick, that's certainly a factor there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it I it's a little surprising McAvoy's there, but yeah, I, you're right about that. The matchups, but um, Ma- that's Mac- five on five. Right? McAvoy has been on the ice for as many high danger chances against as for this season. Just break even fifty percent. So I'm trying to pull up his uh, his contract. I don't know. I know he just signed in Anaheim, but people are dogging on Radko Gudis because he went from one of the you know better defensive in last year as it pertains to shutdown guys with metrics to now being a nightmare in Anaheim. And I saw people saying, well, yeah, no shit. Everybody who goes to Anaheim, it's it, it, their statistics hit the toilet. So, so I mean, I, I Gudis has actually been pretty good there though. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean like it is, I, I, again, I don't know what his, what his co- current contract is and stuff like that, but like, is he somebody that uh, the Bruins could, could uh, circle or, or is he kind of like out of play? I would imagine he's not available. Mm. Um, because I'm just trying I think, to. Think, I think that was like a four-year deal. I'm just trying to think of you know some some guys that 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 management could have in mind f- to fill some of these roles that that they speak of. Because you know we can sit here and speculate all we want, but what our wish list is and what we want them to get. But when they say something, okay, well that's what they're looking for. So there's some weight there, you know. Yeah, G- Gudis's metrics are very good this year, so he oh, has okay. not taken a step back. Oh, I well, don't know. I guess I guess Twitter strikes again. <laughs> Anaheim Anaheim Ducks Twitter led you the wrong way, Brian. No, I mean, you're, no, you're only was... there to look at the jerseys most of the time. But <laughs> no, not the not these ones, the orange not ones. These. When they switch back, I will. No, it was one of those like hockey analytic you know Twitter accounts, and then you have all the people in the comments being the Twitter GMs. I just saw, I don't know, I saw a quote tweet. I, I don't know, it ended up in my timeline. But in any event, I, I, I will tell you, Ilya Labushkins were awful. Really. And... Like he 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 grades that as like one of the worst defensemen in the league, and Toronto just gave up a third round pick for him. So, all right, well we're approaching an hour, guys. Um, trying to think of some other. We well, haven't even hit the ups and downs. We've gone over a couple of them. Um, Bridge on if you want to get that banner going. Yeah. Um, before we do that, there uh, Monty hit his 100th game as a 100th win as a Bruins head coach or NHL coach, but they or was it Bruins? Mm-hmm. Bruins with the coach. Bruins specifically. Bruins coach, yeah. Um, so you know, that's impressive. Obviously, it's it's been a year and a half since he's been their head coach, and last year you you break a record, it's kind of a good start to that. So um, you know, Monty is definitely a without having the same last year, it was easy to talk to talk about the roster and, and and I guess maybe this he maybe Monty can fit in the who's up, who's down. Um, because last year with the roster they had, it was kind of like, oh, well, obviously he's gonna be successful, but you know. They had injuries out of the gate, right? It was not easy to start last year. And then this year, talk about overhaul. So clearly he does a lot well as head coach. I think that he does some – makes some moves that are head-scratching to, to, to the fans and, and those who cover the team. And, um, you know, he he sticks with lines about as long as a, a light is green or a light is, a traffic light is red. But – um, just you know, you guys' opinion on on Monty through his first 100 wins as a Bruins coach. 
I think mostly very good. I think a lot of players have gotten better under his watch. And whether it's last year, this year, had career seasons. Uh, and I think you have to give the coach some credit for that. Um, we know the the second guesses and criticisms from the playoffs, many of which I think were fair. Um, I would also say, you know, during a stretch like this where the team can't seem to play the right way with a lead, like it's fair to look at coaching there. So not perfect, you know, definitely um, with some questions for sure. But for the most part, they've won a lot of games um, and guys have gotten better on his watch. So I would give it like a B plus so far. And the locker room has always seemed good under Montgomery, like being in the locker room, like after the game and hearing what people, the way people talk about each other, hearing the way he talks about the team and, and just getting the sense that nobody, nobody has gotten tired of, of his style or message or anything like that. It seems like they're cohesive, right? If you, if you want to talk about the way that he's gotten them to play over the last two se- not quite two seasons, but um, they they seem to be working together well. It's not like, you know, and everybody's bought in, it seems like. So those are some important things for coaches to to be able to get the team to do. And obviously some of that's player-led. They had some great leadership. Um, this year he has to do that a little bit more than in the past when Bergeron was here and Felino was here, and we mentioned that before. But um, it's hard to say too many bad things about him. And uh, we, we did get like a, a – Maria from Watertown. I she's probably listening right now. Uh, I she called in and was like she was mad at him. And we, and Scott said, um, d- "Call us anybody. Call us if you think that he should get fired already." Um, but we did not get any calls like that. So I don't know how many people are, are ready to to call and and say, "Ah, oh, you got to get that Bruce Cassidy guy back," or you know, go a different direction. This guy's not the answer. Yeah, and and, and Bruce Cassidy obviously had a comment before yesterday's game about having a ring on his finger coming back to Boston, which is probably pretty nice. And look, he absolutely has every right in the world to, to make that comment and feel that way. I mean, I think Bruce had like a six, you know, 67 winning percentage for over six years with the Bruins. And, you know, um, clearly the Bruins thought there was a time for a change and, you know, they've had results and Bruce has had results, but um, yeah, I, I look. I think Monty. Yeah, he's he's a good coach. Obviously, um, again, he needs to be a little bit more decisive. And but maybe he's he's trying to f- figure out what works. He's also trying to keep things fresh over eighty two. Um, but you got to give certain runway to see if certain things really work. Um, but yeah, obviously, good good guy, good coach, good story. Uh, Scott, any final uh, comments on Monty? I don't know if you guys saw this. Uh, Ty Anderson tweeted it out, but so the Bruins have given up at least three goals, eight games in a row now. And it's the first time since 2017 that they've done that. And Ty noted that uh, the last, during that streak in 2017, it was between games six and seven in that streak that the Bruins fired Claude Julian. So not, 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 not the best sign, but you know, I I, I don't think we're quite there yet. (laughs) No. Yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. Ty was just waiting he was just waiting to, to throw that in there. That's no disrespect, but that's got to be like it. That's just very happenstance. That's that has nothing to do with anything. Like there's no there's no correlation between the two situations. <laughs> you better bet that all yeah. the, all the reporters on the ninth floor have the most insane stats that they have like ready to tweet immediately if if oh, some, yeah. something is to happen. Like I'll be walking to the elevator after the game and, and Connor Ryan will be like, damn, they didn't do this. I was going to yeah. shoot off this amazing tweet I had about some random yeah. obscure guy from the 80s that <laughs> got Yeah, the- they'll be they'll be like the like oh, uh the Bruin the Bruin scored two goals in under 18 seconds and Brad Martian said after the game that he had honeycomb for breakfast and <laughs> the last time the Bruins scored two goals in under 18 seconds Chris Kelly had honeycomb for breakfast that morning <laughs> it's like oh my where are these guys well, with these stats Bridget you you've seen me when I get into yes. research mode and that's where I was uh second intermission last night look because Morgan Geeky was the fifth different Bruin to have a hat trick this season so I went down that rabbit hole and it turns out that um 
the only other season in the last 28 years that they've had five different players with a hat trick was 21, 22. Um, and the team, the team record, if you're interested is seven different players in a season, which they did in 1943, 44 and 72, 73. So uh, that's that's how I spent my second intermission last night. Black and white hockey back then without helmets. <laughs> and, oh god. Great. Um, See, this is this is I always thought it was just him using that as an excuse to ignore me because sometimes I'm talking to him and I'm like, hey Scott, and he's just like looking at his laptop, like pretending to be busy, and I'll ask him what he's doing. And he's like, I'm looking up the 1982 season stats for this person, and I'm like you're just ignoring me. You can just, you can just tell me like, you I mean, that, lie about it. that that is an added bonus, but no, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I legitimately just like, if I get something in my head, I just get tunnel vision and like have to keep looking until I find me. And just, the sound, the pitch of my voice just goes in <laughs> one ear out the other. It's just like, he's Googling how to subtly ignore your coworker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I make it really difficult. Let me put it that way. Let's just rapid fire, guys, a couple. I mean, we've mentioned them. I mean, a couple of ups would be the fourth line. We mentioned Boquist, seven points, last seven games. Brazo, Geeky, we mentioned those guys, gave them their ups. Uh, Watherspoon, we mentioned. A um, couple others, or some of the downs, maybe, Bridget? Um. So, yeah, to, I guess to go to the downs first, if we want to do that. Um, we We talked about how – Debrusk is is in another somewhat of a slump. Marshawn is a little bit as well. Um, At what point is it not a slump for Debrusk? And when he scores, it's the anomaly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's that's kind of where we're at uh, at this point for sure. But uh, Forbert, we talked about how he's a down, and he's been he's been an out, uh, not just a down. And I want your thoughts on so this the second line, right? Debrusk, Zaka, JVR. Where yeah. are they in your mind? I, I that whole line needs needs to get going. Like, I they've been on different lines for parts of this stretch, but yeah, I mean, we went through some of it. Like, Debrus one goal in the last fourteen games. Zaka none in the last ten. Uh, Van Riemsdyk's now gone six games without a point. Um, I think they the three of them combined for four shots on goal against Vegas. Like. I think Marsha and Coyle Pasternak, when you, you load them up together, like I think that's a solid first line. That's a good first line. Analytics back it up for the season. The problem is, is are you going to get enough from a second line when one of Marsha and Pasternak isn't on it? And I, I feel like most of the season, the Bruins have not. And I look at Van Riemsdyk, Zach, and DeBrusque, and all three are kind of slumping right now. And it's like, well, that that's probably just not going to be a good enough second line. Like unless they all get going, that's you just need more. Like you, you can't you can't have a second line that's going to go four or five games without scoring. Hey, uh, you know who's up, guys? From Providence, Mark McLaughlin. Oh, just, just in. Broke. Oh my God! Thank God we didn't sign off, and then this <laughs> we could have easily signed off eight minutes ago, and yep. this could have been emergency basis. Bruins recall, Mark. Yeah, because they sent Richard down right before Vegas, so I guess it's time to see Scott's cousin. Well, look, and it's been a while. I mean, he got called up. Was it? It was the. So this will be his first call up since the 2021 22 season yeah i don't think he was up at all last year no he didn't uh, come up. i th i thought he did i thought he got a couple games last year i don't believe so Scott. i don't remember him being up at all last year i don't think so they were such a you know they were such a, a machine all year that they, they never called him up ah i'm right he played he played two games last season no was it mini hockey on the road uh-huh yeah really? it was it was the last oh okay was it the last couple of games uh, no, it was January 28th and 29th. He played back-to-back -back games in Florida and Carolina. Wow, well, there's, there's some egg on my face. I don't remember that at all. I don't either. At all. But in any, he can that's make a better probably not a good sign time. for how he yeah, I was going to say maybe he'll make a better impression this time that <laughs> we'll remember it. Um, so, they yeah, they just sent this email out. It says um, his stats this season, he's appeared in 
53 games in Providence, six goals, five assists, 11 points. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. So, so a, a couple quick notes that come to mind here. Um, part of this is that with the Bruins having had so little cap space, I believe they're at like 835,000 before this call up. It, it actually limits who you can call up. Like it has to be someone under that salary. So like, Johnny Beecher's over that. Georgie Merkulov is over that. Fabian Lysel is over that. Um, so you, you're you're already limited on like who you can call up. Um, Should have called up Trevor Kuntar. Is he over that? He is. He's over that. Eight eight sixty seven. Oh, wow. um, I'm but, sorry. I'm sorry, Marky. <laughs> the other, other because I I can I I'm sure people are going to say well why not just bring Anthony Richard back up he was just here and he was playing fairly well well if Richard plays another NHL game he would need he would then need waivers to go back down and I feel like part of him going down is maintaining roster flexibility through the trade deadline As, like the way I see it is probably get past the trade deadline. And if there's a spot for Anthony Richard, you can bring him back up for good and not worry about waivers, but you probably want to see what your team looks like. Um, see if you add enough and make sure you can keep him as depth without losing him on waivers. Okay. Well, Mark McLaughlin up. <laughs> is, that, is that how we want to finish? Who's up, who's down. <laughs> well, and, and, and so it says an emergency basis, um, Who's who was hurt last night, or or what's the reasoning for that? Was there anybody hurt that we can recall? I don't know. I don't. It did not offer a coinciding uh, injury. Or so sometimes they they can kind of fudge this a little, where like you can kind of pass it off as like, well, someone's questionable, mm. but then you know they're gonna play, and you know really like they're going on the road, so you you don't want to have only 12 forwards like you, you want to have that 13th forward just in case someone actually does get sick or hurt mm. um so that would kind of be my guess i i can't recall anyone suffering any any anything that seemed like an injury to me that the only one that went down was grizzly i think blocked a shot and was hobbled a little mm. bit but obviously he finished the game so well look i mean um, Boquist has played, you know, he's produced, Brazos look good, but you know, like there's still, you know, Loco hasn't really, there, there's opportunity to be had. I mean, McLaughlin, if he wants, if he gets a chance to play, you got to make the most of it. If you want a chance at a second and third and fourth look, but you know, he's got to, he's got to come out and just start hitting people. Here's a chance. Here's his chance, right? He's been waiting a long I mean, time. For unless chance. someone actually is hurt. He's, he's not going to play. He's not going to play. Guess. No, 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 no. But, but that's what I'm saying. Like, at least he got called up. There's a chance. It's you know, if he ever wants to crack the lineup, he's not going to do so in Providence. He's in Boston right now, whether he's on the ninth floor or not. Um, but anyway, so he can okay. have, he can be part of popcorn time with yes. the McLaughlins. Yeah, that that'll be, there'll be two, two McLaughlins ignoring Bridget up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll just sit right in between them and see which one of them will answer me. <laughs> um, any any final discussion points, guys? We're Gone a little bit long at this point, and I know it's a weekend, so you guys want to answer. Like I'm just here. quickly going through to see if anyone <laughs> didn't make it to the end of the game, but not not really. Like a couple of the fourth liners, their last shift was with like four and a half minutes left, but that's not unusual. So. No, and there was power play. There was penalty power play kill, time yeah. there, penalty kill time there. Um, hmm. yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Great. So road trip. A little road trick coming up. Um, so Islanders, some big games. Toronto, know, like, yeah. Two games against Toronto Oilers. Um, yeah, that's that's ne that's this week. Yeah, this week. Can't believe it's already March. Um, and then there's a real big game where on the 14th, where Scott and I are going to Montreal. Brian, you want to come? On the 14th. Mm -hmm. March 14th. You available? Mm, nope. But Brian, <laughs> but but I'm gonna have Shakira on the whole time. 
five and a half hours of Shakira. Are you guys driving up together? Yeah. Oh, Godspeed. We'll, we'll see how that goes. The, this podcast might be down to two people. <laughs> Yo, wait, which, whichever one of us survives. I feel like uh, one of you is going to be tied to the roof like a Christmas tree before that, tri- <laughs> that drive is over. I feel like you're talking about me. Um, I didn't specify. Well, That's up to you guys. One of us is getting left at Hill Farmstead. Just gonna live at the brewery. I don't, I don't know. I don't know who is gonna be. It's on the, on again, the top of the roof, but they'll probably be singing. Uh, whenever, wherever, <laughs> women to be. To, our hips don't lie. We'll get yeah. It's just on loop. Um, yeah. You think I'm kidding, but I no. mostly I mostly did listen to Shakira on my way up last time when I went by myself. Uh, I, but no, we're gonna end up that's leaving. Not happening. Uh, we're gonna. Oh, if I'm driving. Shakira uh, and Harry Styles on repeat. Shakira and Harry Styles, yes. Um, we don't let's and get Creed. Stuck. And <laughs> Creed. <laughs> there, there's playlist. common ground. There's we can agree on Creed. Oh yeah. god, I don't think we ever agreed on Creed, but uh no, I'm gonna leave Scott um on the on the barroom floor after we share a beer tower at uh Peel Pub or <laughs> one of those one of those bars that that they have those giant beer towers and scott and i are going to split one between the two of us and see who who survives i'm going to be just fine godspeed <laughs> godspeed brian we could use your help with that we're recording a pod right after that right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that'll be good all right well we have we have the time to talk about that that upcoming trip for you guys yeah and we will we yeah. will talk about it again I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Maybe they'll celebrate St. Patrick's Day early up in Montreal. But oh, St. Patrick's Day is big up there. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys, we've taken enough of people's time for this one episode. So, if you guys are good, Scott, you have one more thing to say? Nope, all good. I'm Bridget, good. you good? I'm good. All right, thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will talk to you on Monday. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.